So we flipped a thousand houses over a three year period and we made millions, but I didn't have any mentors or people telling me to invest in anything. And I would actually laugh at people when they would invest. And I would say, why would I keep this as a rental to make a hundred or two hundred dollars a month when I'm gonna make thirty thousand a month on it right now? I'm gonna flip it right now for thirty thousand dollars. And I was also young and dumb and didn't know what I didn't know. And when Blackstone came and like offered to buy me and said or not, or they were gonna put me out of business, I was like, You're not gonna put me out of business. I couldn't imagine going from doing thirty flips a month where we had our brokerage and the profit to going to zero. I was like, even if I only do one or two a month, I'm still gonna be making 30 grand a month. I'll be fine. I'm never gonna go to zero. And I was just wrong. And I remember thinking back, like there was this point where I said, man, if I, when they put me out of business and I had like two years of like no income after making hundreds of thousands of dollars a month for three years straight, I was like, man, if I would have just kept a hundred of those houses as rentals, I'd have been set for life. But at the time, buying rentals and putting money away in investments is super boring. You're like, I could have made 30 grand and bought a car instead of making a hundred dollars a month. Okay, I'll invest next month. It's really, it's like, it's like one of those things like I'll start exercising next month or I'll go on a diet next month. Like, okay, I'll invest my money next month for now. I'm going to like keep spending. The Deal Machine REI Podcast. Everything you need to know to get started in real estate investing. Well, okay, here's how it's going to work. Um, Aaron, this is Ryan and Ryan's actually somebody that I met in 2019, uh, they started using deal machine, started wholesaling real estate in St. Joe, Missouri. And he's almost done 400 deals now, wholesaling and also kept some for rentals, right? So how many rental properties do you have, Ryan? Can we count what I have under contract? Yeah, <laughs> you got a few things under contract. Tell me 43. about it. 43. 43 so, under contract right now? No, 43 in total, if you count what I've got under oh, contract. Oh, rental properties. Yeah, Amazing. we got those uh, 11 trailer park lots um, this last, what, two weeks ago. Um, and so, yeah, that, that put us over the 40 mark, which was actually our end of goal last year to be at 40 units or doors, however you want to measure it. Um, mm -hmm. And we did not quite get there last year, but we're above that now. Um, Amazing. So, yeah, it's pretty exciting. So when we started the podcast this year, I asked Ryan if he'd co-host with me. And so this is our, I think, 14th or 15th episode. And so it's been an exciting journey for us to do um, the podcast together. I know, Aaron, you've been doing a podcast for how long? Real Estate Rockstars. Real Estate Rockstars. So I took over Real Estate Rockstars in 2019. And Real Estate Rockstars has been going since 2014. We've had like 1,400 episodes, I think. Wow. So the, I've awesome. done a thousand of them, literally. Like, like wow, pretty crazy. Wow. Uh, I only do two a week now. Um, so the only two, yeah, a week. we were, so we released two a week, but well, there was a time when we were doing three a week, every week, like that's part of how the count gets up there, but that, but it was exhausting. Actually, it was fun and it created this great content. And then we also didn't see monthly downloads is what we were looking for as our metric. Because for us, the podcast was a trying to make it valuable on its own to be for like ad space and things like that. And it was kind of like it. we get, let's say, 300,000 downloads a month if I release seven or if I release 11. That was just the number that we were getting. So there came a point. But if I was only releasing four podcasts a month, let's say, maybe I was only getting 200. So there was a lot of diminishing returns. We kept doing enough podcasts where so we figured out two a week was the amount where we st we kept gaining monthly downloads without diminishing. Because if you have too many, someone like your biggest fans aren't gonna listen to them all. Got it. But if you only have one a month, like you've Ooh. got some fans that would listen to more. So anyway, I do two, yeah. we do two a week. Wow. That's well, awesome. uh, that's amazing. Congratulations. I, I feel like I have a lot of questions, but I'm gonna hold them off now because this podcast is for real estate investors looking to just start out. Would you say that's also helpful? That's also what your podcast is about, or who's your main audience for real estate rock stars? Yeah, and you're rec are you, you're rec recording, but this isn't part of the podcast yet. Or are our listeners, we're gonna look. Them? Yeah, we'll use it as part of the podcast. That's Why not? Awesome. So the our podcast is for well, it's mostly real estate agents. It started as only real estate agents. We only interview real estate agents, but something that's passionate to me. I'm not a real estate agent, right? Something that's passionate to me is real estate investment real estate flips, holding real estate for rentals, things like that. So, so much of what we do is we share tactics on our podcast to teach real estate agents how to be better real estate agents, how to get more leads, how to get more deals, how to make more like we call it vertical income. 
And then I'm trying to now sprinkle on everything that I do to say, hey, guys, real estate agents, when you make $300,000 a year in, in commissions, don't make the mistake I did when I was first flipping houses and not investing for the long term. So we're like, agents, mm -hmm. you should also be flipping some houses too because you come across great leads. And agents, you should also be like keeping some as long-term rentals. So in 20 years, you've got hundreds of houses. Hey, That's and that is like something, I don't know if we've actually said that, but that needs to be said for wholesalers too because we did the exact same thing where we, there was a giant influx of cash. We knew our end game was to, to grow a portfolio. But... You're going to have, a, if you're successful in wholesaling, you're going to have a giant influx of cash quickly. Do something with it. Don't go out and buy the car. Don't go out and buy the fancy vacation home yet. Like put that money somewhere else, invest it into real estate, make more money on it, make some somewhat passive income off of that instead of just, you see it all the time. Wholesalers do it all the time. They, two great months and then they got a new car. Oh yeah. You know. Yeah, I learned it the hard way. <laughs> I, I learned it the very hard way for sure. Yeah. You did? Yeah. What did you spend the money the, on? On all sorts of stuff. So for 2009 to 2012, we discovered uh, courthouse step foreclosures. I was like the third or fourth bidder in Northern California during the foreclosure crisis. Right. And the other guys were like mom and pops. And I had just come from a home building, like large business. So I was the first person in Northern California that actually had built up a fund that we were doing this. So we flipped a thousand houses over a three year period. And we made millions and when we, and, but I didn't have any mentors or people telling me to invest in anything. And I would actually laugh at people when they would invest. And I would say, why would I keep this as a rental to make a hundred or $200 a month when I'm going to make 30,000 a month on it right now, I'm going to flip it right now mm -hmm. for $30,000. And I was also young and dumb and didn't know what I didn't know. And when Blackstone came and like offered to buy me and said, or, not, or they were gonna put me out of business, I was like, you're not going to put me out of business. I couldn't imagine going from doing 30 flips a month where we had our brokerage and the profit to going to zero. I was like, even if I only do one or two a month, I'm still going to be making 30 grand a month. I'll be fine. I'm never going to go to zero. And I was just wrong. And I remember yeah. thinking back, like there was this point where I said, man, if I, when they put me out of business and I had like two years of like no income after making hundreds of thousands of dollars a month for three years straight, I was like, man, if I would have just kept a hundred of those houses as rentals, I'd have been set for life. But at the time, buying rentals and putting money away in investments is super boring. You're like, I could have made 30 grand and bought a car instead of making a hundred dollars a month. Okay, I'll invest next month. It's really, it's like, it's like one of those things like I could exercise, I'll start exercising next month or I'll go on a diet next month. Like, okay, I'll save my, my, uh, I'll invest my money next month for now. I'm going to like keep spending it. Okay, so I think the answer to your question, though, of like, why would I make $200 a month as a rental when I could flip it and make 30k is because if you hold it for a rental for five years, then you can make like 150k because of the appreciation, right? Is that kind of what you were getting? Yeah, at? It, this is exactly right. But it's a it's a it's a more patient game. I mean, it's a much more patient game. And if there and if you have no appreciate, if, if, let's say you don't get appreciation, because kind of like, what I think the way people should do investments is like, no, I'm not going to get appreciation on it. But yep, like agreed. the cash flow is this long, slow game. So 2015, when I reset, I started buying houses in Texas. And then I would like buy 10 a month and nine of them would stay as rentals. And I was like seven or eight months in. And by that time I had 60 or 70 houses. And I remember still thinking like, this is pretty boring. Like I'm flying to Texas every month. I have all these houses now and I'm only making a hundred bucks a door at the end of the day. But it truly was six or seven thousand dollars a month. Now I did that until 2020, and then the market did appreciate a ton. And so when you're talking like if you don't if, if the market never appreciates, what you have is this long-term asset that over time it does build and it scales much bigger than you think. And at any time you can sell it. Here's the other cool thing: like if you're like, should I flip it or should I sell it? So let's just say um, you buy it, and um, you know you're like, man, I want to make 20 20 grand selling it but I'm going to stick with that uh, thing now. Well, in two years, when you refinance it, one of the most beautiful things we came up with was like the cash out refis. Or if it's gone up like 25, you know, gone yeah. up, like let's say it's only gone up 5% in value over that, you know, two or three year period. Well, now you can still get a better loan on it where you're doing a cash out refi where now you're pulling out 20,000 bucks on that loan, but it's tax free. So that's like making 40 or $50,000 a profit. You're making 20,000. Better than selling. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it, better than selling it because you have seller's fees, right? If you're selling a two hundred thousand dollar house, you're going to pay agent fees of twenty thousand dollars ish, yeah. right? It's how you have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. As long as you can be patient for that year or two, you still get to sell it or flip it. You're just flipping it to yourself into a different loan, and you yep. get the cash flow forever, and you get the appreciation forever. I learned it. I learned it the hard way, um, but I saw that's what Blackstone did when they put us out of business. I realized most of their money was made on these cash out refis. And I was like, oh, yeah, especially because people like using your app, wholesalers or things like that. Like you're getting houses at like 60 percent of ARV usually. Mm -hmm. So when like in two years, when you refi, you're going to refi at 80 percent ARV. So it's it's yeah, it's just like being able to flip it and sell it to somebody else as long as you can be patient for those first two years or wholesalers. They should like keep a couple, flip a couple, but like invest the money. Don't think that you're yep. going to have, you know, you're, if you flip 10 yeah. houses this month, don't think that's going to go forever. So let me actually read this post about your biography I found on the internet. Uh, so Aaron is a husband, a dad, and he's obsessed with golf, biohacking, fitness, and making his life better. But most of the content that he puts out is actually for his real estate strategy posts. And sometimes those are confusing, <laughs> is what it says. Yep. And so he's, uh, he's here to provide value on, on this podcast and on his Instagram, which is Amer uh, Aaron Amuchastegui. And we'll put that in the notes if you want to spell it and link to it. Um, but he's a third of the way through his life. I think actually we might live longer because AI is going to cure cancer and everything that gives us disease. But yeah. we'll stay tuned for that. Um, and you're a trend spotter and opportunist. So one of the – like some of the posts that you put out are definitely because you track data like crazy and then you interview people as well on the ground level. Um, but you're always making really interesting posts about like what's going on in the data. So I can't wait to ask you some of those trends and how that's played out in history as well. Um, is, is there anything else you'd build upon that that you'd want people to know listening to this? No, I love – so it's, it's kind of like my new favorite bio. What's funny is I said I'm a third of the way through my life. And some people are like, Aaron, you're 42 years old. Like you're halfway through your life. And I'm like, well, no, I really, I think I may be 20% through my life, but the, but it scares people because that's part of that, like biohacking health thing. You and I ran a half marathon together. You know, we've done, uh, you know, fitness is one of my things. I've got a cryotherapy machine in my house. Like I believe in, I believe we're going to live a long time. And it took me a little while to figure out like, well, the reason I said some of my posts are confusing because some people are like, so what does this mean? Like Aaron, you're posting about, OPEC is like, is like stocking, stopping their barrels of oil. What does that have to do with real estate? Why are you sharing? Or they'll be like, Aaron, why are you sharing your health tips? Because really we're trying to learn from you about wealth. And it's like, no, cause the health is how I have the energy to do the wealth type stuff. Um, and yeah, so no, I wouldn't, I, I don't think there's much to add on that except for like, it's funky to try to put it all together and go like, so yeah. like, who is Aaron? If I'm following Aaron, I'm going to see pictures of his kids playing golf. I'm going to see pictures of Aaron in the sauna biohacking I'm going to see data about like oil and interest rates and real estate trends. And Aaron's going to tell me, Hey, now's the time to go all in or now's the time to sell. So you, and you flipped a thousand <laughs> homes, you said, and it says you own 850 as well, of which I think you say either 50 or 150 are yours outright. And then you have a partner with the rest. Is that correct? Yeah. So the, um, so there's probably, so I have, there's, there's, I have one partner that I have a hundred houses with just me and him 50, 50. I have another partner that I've got about 100, 150 units with. I've got a 70 unit apartment complex with one partner. I've got a, uh, a climate controlled storage in Michigan. I think it's like 300 units. I've never been there. I've never seen it. I just built it, but I have no partners on that one. That's a, it's a giant, like five or $6 million facility up in Michigan. And then I have a bunch of those houses that are as part of a fund where there's people that um, some of them are high net worth individuals, anywhere between 5 million and $20 million of investments where they, yeah. they end up owning like 70% of the house and my partner, I own the other part. I'm, I'm fascinated by this because, so I have nine rental properties um, and uh, like five of them I, I own myself. And then uh, the other four, I actually own with a partner that I, I actually partnered with because when I was starting out, I had just quit my job and become self-employed. So when I found a few great deals, I didn't have the the cash and, and what was really the problem was the employment history to actually take down a rental property. And, but it was such a great deal. And I had found a friend that wanted to do real estate investing. I was like, look, I, I found the great deal. Why don't you put down all of the down payment and also put the mortgage in only your name, but give me 50% of this house. And, uh, 
you know, put my name on title. So we did that uh, when I was starting out. But but going forward, um, somebody asked if I wanted to be a part of like a self storage facility that was raising seventeen million dollars. And and I don't know if this was a good choice or not, but I'm like, dude, I I need more like rental properties. Like I haven't even met my goal of just getting 20 rental properties. And the simplicity that I feel like that will give my life because I don't have to worry about if a partner wants to sell or et cetera, is driving me to continue to get single family rentals. Ryan, I'm curious, you at 43 at 43 properties, have you partnered with anyone or are you are you doing those all on your own? No, Megan and I own own all of ours um we have not a while ago we had heard from a few people the advantage and disadvantage to to owning with partnerships in my mind i was like you know what until i have that number that i want to create enough income that you can say i don't have to push as hard anymore I know myself, I'm never, I, I just love working, so I'm not going to reach that point. But once I have the number of properties that I want for income for the family, put food on the table, then maybe I would explore doing partnerships with other people to grow it even more. But until I had that, that goal accomplished, I was just adamant about we're going to own everything, just us. So yeah. right or wrong, I, that was that that was what, what our goal is. What is your goal, by the way? What's your goal that you're working for? A hundred, gotcha. Mm -hmm. So Aaron, like, what what's your assessment of where me and also Ryan are at right now? Dude, that's cool. I think the I think Ryan, you're following the the plan that if I could do it all over again. Now I needed other people's money in order to like make headway in the space. Now once I like, and there's some opportunities that I got to buy personally that I had to own like 500 before in order to like qualify with the bank because on those other ones that I have with investors, we, there's a lot, I get a lot of cash flow, right? My monthly check from that is really, really big. And it really, really helped when I wanted to get more. So like the, the apartment complex that I was able to buy, right. Or like the land that I just bought, like I just bought some land that I got entitled to build 96 units on. I am owning that one by myself. I'm doing that loan by myself, no partners, no anything on it. I wouldn't have been able to do those without having partners, but it's better to have like 200 houses that you own without partners than have partners period. Like, cause two things too, is like, it's the same amount of work. Now the benefit of the bigger houses, I've been able to like hire teams and we own a property management company that follows that. And now I really only check in with them. Like once every couple of weeks, I have managers managing it. But for a while that felt like a full-time job managing you know those teams where i was only keeping like 20 percent of the net right so ryan's like hey it's not going to be whether he if he had 50 houses with investors or 50 houses by himself it's the same amount of effort right but with investors you get half so i think you i think a lot of people need investors to grow faster like you go into guys and say put it in your name and your mortgage and we're going to split 50 50 that's brilliant right because when i started it was like it's going to be your name and your mortgage and i'm only going to get 20 percent or I'm only going to get 15%. Mm. And so now the only partnerships I try to do are like really for flipping. And I do a lot of those for flipping. Like, Hey, I'm going to do a short term hold right now. Do you want to put $200,000 into this? We'll split the profit or I'll pay you a point and 12% interest. What do you, which, which do you want? What kind of a person are you? So I think, I think mm. Ryan's journey is great. I think that there's one thing that we figured out how to do that might help you get to like a hundred faster is we found some investors that wanted to come in as partners with the ability to buy them out. So it's like, hey, now right now, like maybe there aren't a lot of great deals to get, but there are certain moments like January, 2021, anything someone bought was a steal. We bought tons of properties then and we were pulling in money however we could and we were funding things last minute and, and borrowing money from whoever we could to close them. But like you could find a partner, Ryan, that says, hey, I'll partner with you on these and we're 50-50 or maybe Ryan, we're 70%, you're 30%, but you can buy us out at any time for let's say, you know, 10% more than we gave you. So that would be a way that you could like go buy your next 50 using other people's money. But it really depends on if what's like the, the faster you get to 100, is it a shortage of deals or a shortage of money? If it's a shortage of deals, well then you just need to keep making more deals. But if you have the deals and it's just a shortage of money, like I think most wholesalers are, then I think finding those strategic partnerships that help you gain that volume 
also by doing a certain number of volume, you get the team. So I think, I think Ryan, you have the right goal strategy in mind. D I mean, David, I think you should have a gazillion more properties than you do. I mean, I think, um, the buying, a like maybe a big multifamily or something, like that. but I don't believe in syndications. Like I, I, I don't think, I don't think you should invest alongside of 20 or 30 other people because I mean, one of my funds is like that. Right. But like nobody, but you're a smart guy. If you'd had no ability to do real estate, I would say, yeah, invest in someone else's syndication. But because you have the ability to do it yourself, I would absolutely only invest in your own stuff because no one is going to take better care of your money than you. There have also been mm -hmm. a ton of syndicators over the past few years that aren't good, that aren't very qualified, that aren't very skilled, that, that have been able to raise tons and tons of money that are getting foreclosed on right now. Like all these value add apartments are getting foreclosed on like crazy and they're losing hundred percent of investor money. And these guys that invested in them thought it was a slam dunk. Like oh, I'm going to make 15% a year type thing. So yeah, if I was you, you're, you've got a real estate machine, dude, like don't invest in other people, invest yeah. in yourself. Now, if you want to make a little bit of extra, like become a hard money lender for somebody, right? Like you could like invest in people like that, where you actually get to see the house, you get to choose the person you can foreclose on them if you want to. To get it, if, if you were going to invest in other people, I would invest in like profit splits with people or hard money lending, but not, I wouldn't mm -hmm. invest in a syndication. Interesting. That's we just talked that. with Ryan's uh, hard money lender that he's used a couple of times. Uh, one of the last episodes, that was really fun. Oh, really? Yeah. It, and, and Pat and I have had like four or five other conversations in the last 24 hours because we closed the deal that, that I was using his, um, uh, private money on we closed the deal and then like five minutes after we we closed i called him like hey can i have that back for another one <laughs> oh, hilarious. So it's great like the relationship that's one thing i was going to say is what has slowed us down in getting to that 100 and i know i'm like this has only been three and a half years like i can't put an unrealistic expectation on myself or unrealistic pressure to scale that quick like i feel like we've done pretty well, you know, given the fact that we've had to build construction crews, we've, we've literally found all of our own deals, maybe three or four of them have come from realtors, but it's finding the funding to do more at the same time, because it's like, we have our pool of capital and we deploy it here, here, and here, and we have funds to fix these three properties. And then another deal comes up and I'm like, Oh shoot, how do I get that one? And so I've had to learn and it's a slow moving process for me on how to raise private capital, which would be a great uh, podcast for us to later down the road. What market do you invest in? Right? It's St. Joseph, Missouri. It is 45 minutes northwest of Kansas City. Uh, it's not a high appreciate, appreciating market by any means, but it's super strong uh, rental market. And so I think we kind of have not expanded out of, I mean, St. Joe's our hometown. We live here. We see everything that we're touching all the time. I drive past all, all my homes weekly just because it's the population is 76,000. So you, you're not going to not pass many of your homes, which is cool at the same time. Like, oh, I own that one and that one and that one. Yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, that's something that we've, we've talked about, it's like maybe another market. I want to, I, I deal with a lot of out-of-state investors who don't even come to St. Joe. They just, they buy the deals, we fix them up for them and we just cycle them through our, our stable. I want to try to be an out-of-state investor and do a deal and somewhere else and, and do what, basically what I'm expecting people to do with our company, I want to do with someone else. I think that would be, that'll be a next step maybe this year. I don't know nerve-wracking so aaron uh i just locked in a mortgage for a property i'm gonna buy and the thought that was crossing my head was uh what are these interest rates gonna do is that is that a trend or data that you've been tracking or have any thoughts on yeah so the the i mean the advice i'm giving people if they're gonna buy a new rental right now is if they can make it cash flow at today's rate at like your six and three quarter that you probably locked or six and a half that maybe we got on it. Like the, if it cash flows at that, then I would say buy it. And if you want to own the house 10 years from now, I would say buy it because we will see more cycles in the next 10 years, 
right? But the but I think in most markets, you could buy a house for cheaper six months from now than you can today, right? I, I, Why do you think the prices will go down? They've been going down, right? They've been going down like year over year. We've had, um, I have a graphic that's going to go out on my Instagram in the next couple of days, but it's like 70% of markets are down year over year. And some of them are down 30 and 40% price point year over year. It's a big change, man. And it's not trending back up yet, right? It's still trending down. Now, funny thing was in January, it was only like four or five markets were year over year down because our big run up was like January to March of last year. But you get this idea that there's a lot of people um, kind of in that price point area. So the biggest, the biggest thing that'll drop prices down. So what do I think is going to happen with interest rates? They're not going to go down. I think the Fed's going to raise the rate two or three more times through the end of the year. I think that they really need the economy to break. They're trying to get the economy to break before they're going to start lowering rates before they're going to start buying back uh, from banks. Now, they did do some stuff with those banks a few weeks ago that shows they don't want any banks to fail. But by also raising mm -hmm. the Fed rate, they're setting up more banks to fail because every time mm -hmm. they raise that Fed rate right now, that's the rate that banks have to pay for the money they already have on their books. And they've already invested at other stuff, right? So yeah. it's like a rate that it's like, it's like their lines of credit are getting adjusted too. So, um, but the biggest reason is affordability wise. So I think that interest rates for 30 year mortgages are going to fluctuate between six and 7% for the next two years. I don't think it's going to go down in the next two years. I just cool. Well, I feel good about locking in my rate. Yeah. Then. So I would it cash flowed. So it didn't matter. Yeah. What did you get really what the rate was? It, it was six and a half percent. Yeah. So, uh, the, yeah. So I would, so I'd say you did good, man. You did. So I'm locking in seven year debt on new purchases i'm getting seven one arms on them because i don't believe i'm going to have anything better over the next two and they have heavy pre they don't believe it either because they have heavy prepayment penalties if you're going to pay it off in the next three years so, they, so oh, okay. they're betting on the fact too that rates aren't going to get any better over the next three years but maybe they will on year three so i'm putting seven one arms on everything which means i don't plan on refinancing them until a little over three years from now and one of them, it's 7.15%. My rate's going to be a little higher because I have so many houses. I don't get, like, I have to go through these different commercial loans. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, like, your your loan that, that you're getting is very different than mine, right? Mine was, like, 30-year I can't get a 30-year fix unless I want to get up to, like, eight and a quarter. If I'm going to get Because you have too many houses? Yes, yeah, because we have too many houses. Gotcha. The, and, and, and commercial is the same. Like, on an apartment complex, the, the, the best rate you're going to get right now is, like, 7%. Um, and that's if you got a really, really good one. That's part of the reason these other businesses are failing is people bought value adds a year ago with the plan to refinance them. It's like if Ryan's plan is to buy houses, fix them and refinance them. Now you now he's got to know like his refinance is going to be at seven. What does that change how he's going to do it? But I, so I think, so I think prices are going to continue. To, so rates are going to stay where they're at. So why does that make prices decline? I just got somebody that sent me a prequal to buy a house for 225,000 and their rate seven and a quarter on their 30 year fixed a year ago, they could have bought a house for 575,000. A first time home buyer will give you all their money. They, they ask the lender, how much am I allowed to spend on my mortgage? They aren't saying I want to buy a house and I want my payment to be $1,200 a month. They're going to a lender and saying, how big of a house how can big? I buy? And that lender's right. saying, you can buy a house for this, and the most you can pay is $2,200 a month. They're like, cool, boom, sign me up. And, uh -huh. then, and then they go look and say, what can I afford? So first-time homebuyer, they'll give you all their money, as much money as they're yeah. allowed to. But the guy that could have given you five seventy five dollars a year ago can only give you $225,000 now. So that supply-demand equation by itself will outweigh any of the other factors we have going on in the world that brings prices down. We have a bunch of houses in Austin – where sellers want to sell for five or $600,000 in a neighborhood. First time home buyers can only afford $300,000 in that neighborhood. There's a few that are selling. So like I bought a foreclosure, I fixed it. I sold it in a neighborhood last week for $300,000 and all the comps are still listed at four, but they're not selling. I sold for 300 in there and a guy bought it right away. Opening weekend, the ones at four and 500,000 have been sitting for months at a time. Those four and $500,000 ones are just never going to sell because their mortgages are like 300, 350. So now those people are never going to, sell right now and move into another market so uh, yeah that's that's my prediction is price is still going to get a little bit lower in most markets there's some markets that are actually appreciating on the east coast washington yeah. dc tampa florida fayetteville arkansas there's some random outliers but most places mm -hmm. it's depreciating well congrats on the deal that you just sold in austin 
uh, I want to talk about the foreclosure process because like when you say you bought it at the foreclosure process, from what I understand, if somebody misses a payment, the bank actually sends a notice what after 90 days that says like, Hey, we may start the foreclosure process. Is that kind of how it works? And that's when you find out about it. That's different in every state, man. So California is 90 days. You get a 90 day notice that says you missed your payment today. So if someone misses their payment there, it was due April 7th. They would have gotten a notice probably last week that said, um, you're going to auction in 90 days, which is May, June, July. Right. So they're going to get a notice to go, Hey, July, 21st you're scheduled for trustee sale and then they're going to get another notice 30 days out that says hey next month you're scheduled for sale uh Mm -hmm. texas is a little different texas is a 30-day state which means so if somebody missed their payment on april 7th the deadline for trustees to post in texas is 21 days before the auction in california the auction is monday through friday every day in texas it is the first tuesday of every month um, okay. you know, in Georgia, it's the first Tuesday of every month in Oregon and Arizona. It's like every day. So every, so different States are different, different timelines. Arizona is like California, Oregon's like California, Georgia and Texas are similar. Um, and, uh, like Chicago is similar to Texas. So somebody misses their payment on April 7th. They're behind. Let me look at the calendar to see what our deadline was. So on April 11th, so the next auction in Texas is on May 2nd, right? That is 11 days from now from the time we recorded this, who knows when uh, this is actually getting out there. So last week on the 11th was three weeks before auction. So that was the deadline for trustees to post. So anyone that didn't make their payment on April 7th, which was their mortgage said, four days later, they were sent a, no- uh, a notice of auction saying your house is going to sale on May 2nd. So three weeks from now. So you missed one payment. You don't get a chance to miss a second payment in Texas. You get foreclosed oh on if you miss one. Um, the unfortunately like one of the ones that i bought a couple weeks ago the lady goes i bought it i go leave a note i bought your house today we had actually door knocked their house the week prior and said hey let us buy this house from you you have a lot of equity they said we're going to make the payment it's not going to go to sale okay cool we ended up buying the house and we called they don't know we're the same people that stopped by the house at first and they said we didn't think it was going to go to sale that fast we thought no matter what like we had time like our friends told us that this takes Three months, nine months, things like that. The, the foreclosure moratoriums, but no, like the paperwork that you sent or they said they were going to foreclose on it if you didn't pay the fee. So that notice that they got, they got a 21-day notice and it said, hey, you have missed $2,000 in payments. Um, you have to now pay us $2,000 plus a late fee before May 1st at noon or you're going to foreclosure sale. Now, they can, they can postpone a few times. So they could call their lender and say, Hey, I just listed it for sale. I got an offer. Can you delay it a month? The lenders are allowed to delay it. And so it could be in some cases, people do get two or three months. Um, but you have to be proactive to do that. You have to really try. You have to ask, you have to show them that you're trying in order to get it delayed. They're going to have to show like I hired a real estate agent. The pictures are on MLS or, Hey, we got an offer, but they just can't close it for a month. We've been able to delay them before by like, we make an offer to buy they send the the lender their contract and they can get a a stay from it. But it's a very fast process. So then when it goes to auction on May 2nd, there's at courthouses all over Texas, the same time, same place, like 10 AM on the first Tuesday, every different County, 256 counties or something like that. The trustees will show up to the courthouse. And sometimes these are attorneys. Sometimes these are just regular people and uh, they're, they're not banks, uh, but the bank has hired them to do it. And they come to the courthouse and they say, Hey, this, House is one, two, three, four, Legend Pond Drive in New Braunfels. Uh, John Smith had the loan. He first got the loan in 2021. Our opening bid is 201,000. Do we have any takers? And if nobody's there, so they say going once, going twice, sold, and it becomes a bank owned property that you would see on the MLS as a foreclosure. Oh, hmm. wait, wait, wait. Okay, okay, okay. So they, they'll start it at 201 because that's what he owes? Or is that a percentage of what he yeah, owes? Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a really good question. They have the ability to put it as much as they owe plus legal fees. So let's say the house is worth 400, but the loan is 200,000. They can't put the opening bid at 300,000, right? They have to start it. The most they can put it for is for what's owed plus a penalty. So let's say the guy owes, owes to, uh, you know 200,000. They could chart, they could have it be like maybe 210 would be the highest opening bid they could have. But even if it's worth 400, they can't have it be higher. 210 is a number. But let's say it's only yeah. worth 200. 
Mm -hmm. they have the ability to actually bring it on for less. So they could say, you know what? Opening bid's 140. We don't want to own this property. The really strategic banks will figure out what they think is the price to sell it for because they want their cash that day. Because that day when you win the bid, you hand them cashier checks, bank gets their cash, they're done with the property. Yeah. So, wow. so to sit at the auction, which is what you've done, right? Yep. That's what you do. Uh, you actually have to come with like a cashier's check already. Is that correct? Yeah. It's cashier's to check be already. There. And it's a... So you're only allowed to bid up to the amount of money of the size of the cashier's check that you have brought with you that yeah. day. Okay. How so if you're just starting out you listening to this month? podcast, you probably have to find it before it actually gets to the foreclosure auction. So, yeah. So there's the way that we really go to auction though, like that it, it kind of goes into both, both your questions on that. Like when we're showing up to an auction, we're showing up like with a list of 10 houses. And we're saying our max bid for one, two, three, four Main Street is 108,000. Our max bid for one, two, three, four Legend Pond is 200,000. Our max bid for this one, because we don't know if it's going to come out for the debt owed or a dropped price. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say the debt owed is 200. If my max bid's 175, I still show up and I hope the bank is going to drop the price at the last second. You never know. So you show up. Like the bank will be there? The, the bank won't be there. The bank is guiding the trustee, that person that, that's okay. standing there. Um, and then, so the other thing is, so let's say I've got $400,000 to go to auction. I could have like five houses that my max bid is a hundred thousand. I could have two houses that my max bid is 200,000 or one that my house, that my max bid is 400,000. So in theory, I could buy four $100,000 houses, two $200,000 houses or one $400,000. I don't want to go too fast, but let's say you only have 400,000, right? You could get one big house or four small houses, let's say. So the way the cashier's checks are broken up, it's like a wallet. Like if you look in your wallet, you've got some $100 bills, you've got some $20 bills, you've got some $5 bills, and you've got some $1 bills. And if you were going to try to like do exact change, you would kind of have like, if, if every time you bought something, you're like, I always want to have exact change, right? Then you'd have like 21s, 10 fives, 10 tens, like 520s and some hundreds. We do the same things with cashier's checks. You just add a few zeros. So you've got a couple hundred thousand dollar checks. You've got some $50,000 checks. You've got some $10,000 so checks. checks. Some five, all different amounts. So that way, because okay. because let's say I go to an auction two with that list of 10 houses, only two of them is actually going to go to sale. The other eight, the people were actually able to postpone or we, or we bought them the week before and the people just didn't know until that moment. Like, because we could door knock and buy from people ahead of time. People can use your app and buy from people ahead of time. So the, yeah, so that's, so you go with a wallet with a bunch of checks and you try to, you're, you're ready to buy. And, and we say like, we don't fall in love with the house. We have our list and we're like, if we buy any of these, we're happy. Wow. So when you come, that's super interesting. When you come to the auction, you've already got a list of the houses that you know you want to bid on. Yep. And you already know what your max bid is. Are you telling them your max bid ahead of time? Or is that just for yourself to know, okay, I don't want to bid more than this. It's just house. for yourself, man. It's just an awesome game of poker because you're there and there. Cause here's the thing, dude, sometimes the opening, there was one uh, last week, two weeks ago, the opening bid was 200,000 and our max bid was 400,000. And you're like, <laughs> you're, you don't just it's jump to fair. four. You, we're like going 201,000. And the other guy goes 202,000. And the guy goes 203,000. Like you're holding up a paper. Yeah. Well, in, in some cases, you don't have a paper. This? It's actually like way less formal, dude. It's like I'm somebody's talking on their phone to their boss. Yeah. I'm sitting here oh, and, no. the, and we're all standing like four feet apart because when the, <laughs> because like everybody's standing in like the courthouse steps. And then when they say the house, like most people get out of the way that aren't interested and then the two or three that want to bid, we step up because we're all excited. Our heart starts beating. Yeah. So you're like only a few feet away. So I'm just going like 201. Other guy says 202 and the auctioneer is just kind of pointing back and forth. It's way less formal. They're like writing on the back of a piece of paper. They're flipping it over. They're like writing on their hand. Yeah, yeah. Way informal. So David, if you, do you want to practice powerful, it? Do you want to do I it? I definitely want to go. Yes, Let's I want to go. It. All right. We got a uh, house right here. Do they have an envelope? I assume that's what they do. So they're, they're right, like reading got, an envelope. Yeah. Okay. So we got, uh, we got 124 Kipling Street. Street. That's uh, nice. a great street. Do they tell you about the house? No, they would say who it is and how much they okay. paid for it or how much their loan is. All right. This is uh, Bernie Rotenbar uh, and uh, 200000 is what is owed. And so Me. I'd we'll, like that. Okay. So we're going to start at 200000 Is that? Is I'm that, putting my hand up. 
I want, I want so that. So Ryan would say 200,000 to you. Okay, 200,000, David. 201,000. Yep. Oh. Or Ryan says the next price, and then Aaron. Okay, you raise it's two hundred one now. Do we have another? Do we have another bid? So you. Oh really, David? You're going to bow out at two hundred one. I already have it at two hundred. Why would I get two hundred one? I bid two hundred one. Because he oh. just bid two hundred one. You need a, you need to get more properties. I'm trying to help you out here. No, I definitely do. So if I if I can go, I'll, I can just go. I just need a cashier's check to enter the room. Is that how it yep. works? You, you and you and. Here's what's funny. You could bid like 200,000 and somebody might go 210,000 or someone might say 200,000 and a penny, 200,000 oh, and a oh, dollar. Geez. There's no, oh, there's no required overage. So I could just, every time you bid, I could just go a dollar more, a dollar more. It's like okay. all these weird poker That's strategies that annoy people. Yeah. Yeah. So if I have a cashier's check for 300 grand and I get it for 205, are they going to give me change back later? Uh, later. You're going to sign over that $300,000 check. And in about two or three weeks, they're going to mail you back. They're going to, they're going to send you back the, um, got it. So if I give them my $300,000 check, even though I only spent two Oh five, I cannot buy, I can't bid on the $90,000 house that comes up next. That's why you bring a wall of the checks. My, they have my mm. big check. That's yeah, why you I give them. You. A, so instead saying. you're going to give them a 200,000 and a 10,000 and you're still going to have $90,000 left to bid on the next one. Mm. Cool. And if you don't spend anything, you can always call your bank and cancel the cashier's check, right? And you, you get just take it back. back. Yeah. You take it back and they redeposit it. Okay. Cool. Dude, our market does not see stuff like that. Like, I, the, the, I, this does not exist in St. Joe at all. I could right. not Aaron, go and do this. Aaron just perked up. He's about to I'm look like, up St. Joe right, right? now. So like, Let's yeah. do it, please. Because we'll if it is, I'm missing out on something huge. Dude, th how crazy would that be? that everyone knows who you are because you own so many properties in that, in that small town, but they've been keeping the secret. <laughs> you, like, we're they're, never they're gonna, don't tell Ryan. Do. He doesn't even know. All right. So like, like oh, there's a lot. Of, so next week on the, tw or th in three days on the 24th, like Kansas city, Missouri, Jackson, Missouri, Waynesville, Missouri, Troy, Missouri, Marshall, Missouri, St. Louis, Leeton. Can you look up an actual city? Yeah, well, so where is St. Joe compared to St. Louis? Well, it's Kansas City, so it's the other side of the state. Yeah. Yeah, so like North Kansas City, or is it like, is that part, is it Kansas City, is it just part of Kansas City? It's 40, not part 40. of Kansas City at all. It's it's far enough away that it's not part. Oh, so I'm it's, sure Kansas City sees right, plenty so there's of nothing in St. Joseph this month, dude, but there are lots <laughs> of them in Kansas City. And, and um, I'll check. I'm gonna I know but people Saint Joseph has some. What's that? The, in the past? Can you see if they've had any in the past? Yeah. Let me, we're jump, we'll, I'll jump around for a second. He's going to say zero. I mean, if town of 57,000 or town of 70,000, there won't be a lot of them. Right. Well, if they don't have an auction in St. Joe, what happens when somebody can't pay their mortgage in St. Joe? Yeah, they, I mean, they would have to. So what county is it, Ryan? Buchanan. Buchanan. Pre foreclosure. Aaron, what tool are you using? Data. I'll go back from like April, May, June. It's be really interesting to see. This is so awesome. I, this is what I'm saying. This is freaking awesome. I was going to make a joke earlier. I feel like now is the right time. Do the joke. When I read the bio, it. when I read the bio for Aaron, it said Iron Man. I'm like this dude. Oh yeah, I Iron skipped Man. over that. Like you are the Iron Man. I, yeah, it's that's that movie. You've seen that movie? Yeah. Now I'm watching you, and you're like doing all the. If I now, if I was able to tell I'm my computer, at next level, Ryan, is if I said, "Hey, uh, do we have any foreclosures out in?" Yeah, they pop up. Out in Buchanan, Missouri. Oh, guys. So in Buchanan. <laughs> There's been since December to now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Let's see what? if you know any of these. So 2503 Juniper Lane, you got Edmund Street, you got at. Galvin Road, you got Lafayette Street, Dover Street, Mitchell Avenue, Mark Twain Drive. You gotta know where Mark Twain Drive oh is. Oh my gosh, Seneca are you Street, kidding me? Crystal, so one of them sold for as little as $7,000. Um, Aaron, can you show us what you're doing on your screen? Yeah. Let's see. Is that awesome? Oh, 
oh man, I gotta find out. This is this is crushing. See if I can find right here. So you've got like here's one that was like built in 2000. So this one is just went to sale. April 2nd, 20, uh, 4704 Crystal Drive. They had a $119,000 loan on it. Are you guys seeing this? Yeah, it yeah. just came up. Okay. So the um, so 4704 Crystal Drive, St. Joseph. This is, um, and, and you can like kind of, you can zoom in and see where they are. So here's our, here's what, here's what it looks like. Here's what our property looks like. You know, house built in 2002. Opening bid was going to be 119,000. And then we could quickly see like, what is that really worth? It says it is worth 234,000 and the opening bid was 119,000. Out there. Yeah. Okay, so the, Ryan, how'd you not know about this? <laughs> I don't know. If you're the it's, king of St. Joseph, this is horrible. Man, somebody else. So the funny thing guys this is, horrible. is I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing. The crazy part is that's the way auction though is the first time I came to Texas, when I left California, there was my first time going to California, there was three people bidding hundreds of houses sold. First time I got to Texas, there was like no one bidding and like 30 houses sold. And I was like, Oh my gosh, it's like going back in time. When I got put out of business in California, there was hundreds of people bidding on three houses. When you have a hundred people bidding on three, you're not going to get a deal. So there could be one yeah. that nobody's doing the stuff out there. And when Ryan shows up, we will still show up to auctions, guys. I sell the foreclosure list in Texas. I market it like crazy on social media. I teach a class on how to do it. Where it's all, I wrote a book about it. All my secrets, my whole steps, everything I do, I've given away. So everybody knows my exact strategy. I will still show up to counties and be the only person there and buy a house. Amazing. Oh, my gosh. So let me Jeez. just break down the foreclosure process one more time. So if you're like new and you're trying to wholesale a deal, you need to catch somebody that is going into foreclosure, but has not gone to auction yet, right? Because as a, as a wholesaler, without a cashier's check, you, you can't yeah. go in the auction and bid on those properties, right? right? So is is the list you just showed us, is that like a list of properties that is going to be uh, to sale, for example? Yeah, so- the, Has not yet, but going to. So there's one scheduled for April 28th, Brian. You gotta write this mm -hmm. down. It's 4915 Stonecrest Terrace. Right. So that one has not gone yet. So the list, so the list I pulled up has both, but like if I pulled up, um, you know, Austin, Texas and where we live, David, in our area, it would show us a hundred houses scheduled for auction next week or in two weeks that are within like a 30 mile radius of us. Cool. I think I want to go just to, just to like go. Yeah, and learn. you should totally come. But for wholesalers, like your point, exactly. So a wholesaler, should take the list and go knock on the door and go say, Hey, help us, help us sell your house. And then people go, I don't, I'm don't worry. It's not going to sale. You go, well, just in case, like I can lock this up for you. They get the contract signed right then. Now they could probably provide that contract to the bank to get a delay for two weeks. Or if nothing <laughs> else, I have people reach out to me all the time that say, Aaron, we use your list. We got this one tied up, but we don't have the money. Can we assign the contract to you for like 10,000, 20,000? Absolutely. Because it's going to be, you're going to get a way better deal. That, that house that had the opening bid of 200,000, they went for four. Like I could have paid them 230 or 240. They walk, the seller walks away with 30 or 40 grand. And I paid more than that at auction. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Amazing. Okay. So, but then, then you can actually go to the auction if you have cash and you want to start investing yourself. Yep. And then tell me about the third stage. If the opening bid doesn't get taken, then it's owned by the bank, right? So that's like a different list. That's correct? a different list. And so how do you, do you, is, do you have a prayer to get properties from banks these days if it's owned by the bank? Yeah. I, I want to finish part of that last section really quick on that idea okay. of my first hundreds of houses. I didn't have any cash but I had to find investors that had cash. So also wholesalers, mm -hmm. like if you also already have investors that like maybe buy your deals, like if you learn the foreclosure process, you could learn the foreclosure process and then go to them and say, hey, let's partner on this flip. You bring the money, I bring the research, we're gonna buy this foreclosure and do it together. Most of the people bidding at auction aren't using their own cash, right? And so that's something important. Even now, I'll use half my own cash, half other people's, to buy more. So you do need cashier's checks, but it doesn't have to be your money. So don't think that, you, that you're that out of it. Now, if nobody bids on it, 
it becomes a bank owned foreclosure. And yet, and it, by then it's too late if you're a wholesaler. If you're trying to get it, you could knock on the door and say, hey, sell me your house. They could say they want to, but they don't own it anymore. The second that that auction happens, they don't own the property anymore. They can't change their mind. They can't make the payment to the bank. They, they've lost all their opportunity. Now, we do have a – we sell lists of that that says, like, who the lender is. And I've had a lot of times where I sent out, like, FedExes to lenders and said, hey, I'll buy this house for this much money. I would send them offers. Like, hey, it went to auction for this. I would have bought it for that, but I missed the auction um things like that i've had a very low response rate i have bought one or two houses that way but it was a lot of effort to do it and um most of the time once they own it they realize like okay they wanted their money fast but now that they own it they're gonna have to wait a few weeks they're gonna have to do the eviction process so at that point the bank goes fine we're gonna try to maximize our profit now so they're gonna hire a real estate agent to manage that eviction probably do some fix up and hire them to sell it. If you're a real estate agent, you want to get that lead, then, you know, you could, it, the, I wouldn't try if it says like bank of America or Wells Fargo, but if it's a smaller local bank, which some of them are like the, then you might actually have a chance. Like Ryan, if everybody knows Ryan up in St. Joe, like he, like any of the yeah, local banks the bank. there, like he might have a chance to go into them and say, Hey, um, can I buy that one that became an REO or can I find a listing agent for it? So uh, Commerce Bank, Flanagan State Bank is one of them, uh, TOWD, Master Funding. So you've got some different ones that kind of sound like, there's also MERS and like Fairway Independence. There's some bigger lenders too, but those ones I mentioned seem small. Um, so if yeah. it's a smaller bank, you could try to reach out. Bigger banks, I wouldn't even try. They know at this point right. they want to they want to sell it for max dollars, which happens on MLS. Hmm. Got it. Dang. Dang. <laughs> said is it possible time. that I can say this I think I've already said this on another podcast, but I'm like, this is this is now my new favorite episode. You just like, it, this I knew you so were gonna awesome. say it. it just <laughs> depends on when you publish it, right? Like you can't like you just gotta keep publishing in them in the same order because someone else will be your new favorite next week, man. Ah, geez. We'll see. We'll see. I think it's good though to always keep leveling up. And I feel like we definitely did that with this episode. Thank you so much, Aaron. I really appreciate it. Yeah, hopefully Aaron. I provided value and got to tell your guys about some of the, you know, some of the stuff. Who knows where you were going to take it, man. I just answered the questions. We talked about foreclosures for a while, but I can obviously get long-winded about it. I love that stuff. No, I Give think us it was like awesome. three. Yeah, yeah. Give us three bullet points about your passions of golf and biohacking. Yeah, so the golf is one of the only things that like stresses me out. And I think it's really good Ooh. to have something that like, so when I'm on the golf course, man, and I'm looking at like a three foot putt it for whatever it is, something about that sport, because you're just battling against yourself because it is like, like you're using muscles, but you're using like muscles in a very slow fashion. So if you're stressed, all of a sudden your arms go like this and it doesn't work anymore. So I'll say nothing stresses me out. Million dollar deals, lawsuits, like negotiating stuff. That doesn't like really get me going. A three foot putt really gets me going. That's where it's like challenging myself to get better and better. I think it's good to have something you challenge yourself to get better and better at. And it's also good to have something where you can't think about anything else. So if I'm having a bad day and I go golfing, I can think about that bad day a little bit, but there's some moments where all I can think about is that golf shot that I'm happy that I'm yeah. having. So one of my golf's one of my favorite sports. The I played this morning. Love I'm gonna it. keep playing. You know, I hope I play every day of my life. Um but I don't play every day of my life, but that's the goal next biohacking. Uh, I, every morning I exercise, I get in the sauna. I use my cryotherapy tank. Um, you know, the, I've done five day water fast where I don't have any food for those five days to see the benefits of it. Um, I think when we ran our, our half crazy, intense. yeah, when we had our half marathon, I was in food. full ketosis cause I just started eating again, but I hadn't eaten a carb. I hadn't, I literally had not eaten a carb in like three weeks when we did that one. So I was just burning, body fat. I do think that we can live for a really, really long time. And I've got this thing on my thing behind me. It says at the top, I wrote, I heard it for uh, Jesse Eitzer when he spoke, it says like, no one wants less energy right there, but we right. all make That's decisions like we do. So no one wants less energy. None of us are going to wake up and say, I want less energy today, but we might go eat the cookie at lunch. We might go eat like the sugar cookie while we're in there. We might go eat the piece of pizza. We might have two extra pieces. We might already be full. We might have two extra pieces knowing that we're going to have less energy, but we don't connect the two. So no one mm -hmm. wants less energy, but we make decisions all day long that will give us less energy. We could smoke, we could drink, we could eat unhealthy, whatever. We could decide not to exercise. So part of biohacking, I think, is I always want my body to have more energy, 
I want to be able to live a really, really long time. That's also part of like legacy with my, with my wife and kids and everything else. I want to, I want to live a long, long time so we can see that. My dad died or died pretty young. I think that's part of what pushed me with that. But I think there's a lot of ways to get started with like biohacking. Um, but there's, you know, if, if you kind of search it and see the options that are out there, some of the most popular things that people start with is like intermittent fasting, you know, red light saunas, uh, cryo places. There's like little, um, if you look up like cryotherapy or like sauna, you'll probably find like a local facility that does that. I get, I get IVs all the time. I get testosterone injections. I do a lot of things to try to make myself feel younger. Um, so I can keep up with you guys. So I, I want to have your level of energy and, and my level of experience of brains, right? I don't know. You seem like you're doing pretty well, but man, yeah. I want to have you back. Uh, hopefully it's okay in a couple of months to invite you back to talk more about flipping the actual house, more about the lawsuits that you mentioned and uh, about selecting painters and getting your team to care about your money as much as you do. Just little tidbits that uh, we've scratched the surface on, on a personal level, but I feel like would be very interesting to, to dive deeper in. Is that okay if I invite yeah, you Yeah, dude, totally invite you. I'd, I'd always love, love to get to talk to you guys, and the uh, maybe next time I won't be so long-winded, we'll get to cover more topics. Ryan, well, I think it was perfect today. No, I was I interested too. the entire time. Ryan, what was your biggest takeaway? Uh, I mean, this that that's the strategy you use with the, with the auction – like I, I'm going to, now I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight because I'm going to be like looking up all these dang addresses so I can go and be the guy. Cause I do feel like, I mean, it's hard to, to always stay laser focused on one thing, but man, this seems like it's, if, especially in St. Joe, if nobody's doing this, I'm just like, let it happen. I'm not even trying, mm -hmm. you know? So like, that's the biggest takeaway and the, and the other you're, you're freaking Iron Man. So, I mean, sitting right here. A huge takeaway that I had at the beginning was uh, you actually, as a beginner, have an advantage because Aaron can't get properties. Uh, he can't get loans for less than 7% right now. But as a beginner, you can get stuff around six, six and a half, right? So that's actually an advantage uh, to being somebody like Aaron. So that means you don't have to get as good of a deal for it to cash flow as well. And so that was really motivating for me. Uh, just to go out and find more deals that cash flow with the loan product that I have right now, um, being more of a, a novice, right? Only nine rental properties. So I've, I've, I can do that for a few more deals. And that was really motivating to me. Yeah. A novice hey, can tell totally me one more question. Um, can I squeeze yeah, one well, more question? Yeah. When you're like, say you're take yourself back to me, like how many, or would you suggest doing cash out refinance finances on, on a portfolio altogether? Like so far there's been majority of them that we have, but we've been kind of reserved about always doing a cash out refinance. Like we'll get it fixed up. And then it's like, should we not do that and pull that capital out? But then we feel handcuffed when it's like, we don't have capital. So is it better yeah, I mean, or worse? Same like, question. Well, I probably have like 700,000 in, in, in equity since appreciations happen. Yeah. Right. So the, again, the coolest part about cash out refi money is it's tax free. So whatever you get, if you can cash out refi $25,000, that's like somebody like, that's like flipping a house and making 50, right? Wow, In that okay. instance, it's like, so if you're like, Hey, should I flip 10 more houses at a $50,000 profit this year? You would say yes. So if you've got 10 houses that you can refi and pull 20, 25% out, the two things to think about is you want to make sure, is this a house I want to own in 10 years? But you have to ask yourself, is this an asset that I like that I want to own in 10 years? And if so, do a cash out refi, even though rates like aren't what they, yes, we should, we all should have done it last January. We all should have done it 15 months sure. ago. Yeah. I refied as many as I could in, in January. There was like five or six. I didn't get out in time. I was hundred percent cash out refi. If it's an asset that you're going to own in 10 years because of the, the, the tax implications on it, it doubles up and, um, and it gets you more capital. Even if all you do with that capital, Ryan, is just put it in your pocket and be ready to buy a better deal in six months when, if prices do come down a little bit more. Yeah, love it. I but your, your rent it. rate still has to cover the- payments, Yeah, you still have right? the cash flow. Uh, so yes and no. So let's say you pull out $25,000, but you're at a negative cash flow at a hundred bucks a month. You're still That's getting 20 deal, years of- Yeah, you're uh, still getting- You're getting 20 years of cash flow up front now, but you're really getting 50 years of cash flow up front because it's tax-free. 
Mm, so like, yeah. you don't want to be like upside down 10 grand a month if you can't cover it. Right. But like you could cash out refi, refi 20 grand, put 5,000 bucks in a, in a cut recovery account for your cash flow. If you only had one or two houses, I would give you different advice, Ryan. Like for a listener that has right. one or two houses, I wouldn't be maybe quite that aggressive. Ryan, right. uh, I know David has an income. Ryan has more of them. Uh, but that's what, that's what we're doing. Because you can look at it a couple of ways. A newbie that only has one house, it's not very likely they're going to make 20000 on a cash out refi and put 5000 in a savings account. It's just tough. Right. If you're really good at that, like do it. Put it in a savings account even if you are slightly underwater on your cash flow. So the example, we just finished... A house last Friday, appraisal came back Monday, one hundred sixteen thousand. I only have forty thousand into it. Yeah, and I'm like, I want to, I want to pull all of it out. And Megan's like, Dude, pull it all out. Like, it's, 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 <laughs> it's right now with that. It's just like you flipped it. You're gonna pull out yeah. forty grand in money on it. Your interest payment or your mortgage payment is gonna be six hundred bucks a month on it. Yep. And so if you bought it for forty. Your mortgage payment six hundred. If it can rent for around six hundred, like the then do it. I can rent it. It's rented already. I've got it rented for nine hundred a month. Yeah, that's a no brainer, dude. Like take the, you get both, man. You get a cash flow property and you just flipped it to yourself. <laughs> okay. Oh man, that, that's so exciting. I feel like uh, we both learned some stuff on this episode. So I'm sure our listeners will too. Yeah. Aaron, for can't sure. wait to have you back, man. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting yeah. me. You guys want to check out. Yeah, if you guys want to check out Aaron, uh, I think Instagram's probably your favorite place, right? Instagram's my favorite place. People can ask me messages on it. I've got, you know, I've got a, a cheap book that I, that teaches people how to make foreclosures. I make like a dollar every time somebody buys it. It really is all my secrets. Um, but on Instagram, people message me. I've got links on there to like my foreclosure courses and videos. But really, everything I have, I give away for free. So cool. I'm gonna go buy the book. Cool. I'm gonna go uh, buy the book today as well. Yeah, Aaron Amuchastegui, A-M-U-C-H-A-S-T-E-G-U-I. And we'll see everybody next time. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Deal Machine Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please leave us a review and follow along wherever you're listening to your podcast.